before starting, also one quick announcement. So I'm giving the talk today with Benjamin, who is also here now in the Sue meeting, who is the main PhD student behind most, uh, or I would say all of the work you see today in this talk. Uh, and yeah, uh, and therefore, I think I wanted to give him the chance also to, to present uh, the ideas uh, that we are trying to, to push forward. Good. Um, so with that, let me let me dive into into the talk. So um, before actually starting, let me maybe bring everybody to the same page. So what are learned uh, database management components? So the main idea of a learned database management system component is that we want to replace a classical handcrafted component by a machine learning model. And uh, the maybe most prominent work in this direction that started this line of work is on learned indexes where uh, people started to replace a classical index structure such as a B-tree with a machine learning model that takes over the same functionality as the database management system component. And overall, this direction is very attractive because uh, it has not only shown that uh, such learned components can improve cl over classical components in terms of performance, uh, but also on the other hand, since these components are learned, you can get rid of the manual engineering effort that are typically needed uh, for implementing uh, complex components such as index or query optimizer in the classical world. Uh, so in the learned world, you uh, can actually then reduce this man manual engineering effort and adaption effort and, uh, and so to say automate the software engineering or the engineering part of coming up with such components. And the second interesting uh, 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 observation here is that learned components is uh, something that is really widely applicable and different papers have shown that uh, uh, this general idea of replacing classical components with a machine learning model cannot only be used for indexes, but actually for a broad range of different components, meaning for uh, learned query operators, for example, so you would learn a better join algorithm or query schedulers and many more components. So um, to make it uh, short and summarize, so the overall idea of learned uh, components seems actually quite uh, attractive. And, and therefore the question is, uh, so what's wrong with uh, how we learn components today? And this is what um, motivated us here uh, in Darmstadt to rethink a bit how we should do learning uh, or how should we should learn components for database systems. But before now going actually into the main contributions of our work, let me quickly summarize how learned components are being realized today. And for this, uh, let me uh, maybe uh, take a quick example where we try to learn uh, a model that can do query runtime prediction in a database management system, which is a core component that uh, uh, actually can inform other components such as a query optimizer or scheduler. And the predominant approach to realize uh, Learn components in general, not just such a query runtime prediction component, uh, is what we call workload-driven learning or learning 1.0, uh, as we coin it in, in the sequel of the talk. And with learning 1.0, so with the state of art uh, of the art, how learn components are realized today, you see typically the following blueprint, blueprint to realize a learned database component. So the basic idea is that you first take your database, uh, so your set of tables with uh, certain tuples that you have and run a representative workload on, on this database uh, that allows you to capture the observations you want to learn. For the runtime prediction, it would be, for example, you would run different queries and the query plans and observe their, uh, their runtime on, on the given database. And this is then used as training data uh, to learn, uh, for example, the runtime prediction model. So once you, once you learn this model, you can then use it at inference time to, for example, predict the runtime for new unseen queries, but over the very same database. So as I said, uh, so while this direction has already shown promising results, uh, since it can, for example, better capture uh, correlations in data and complex effects of query plans, uh, uh, it's highly unattractive in practice. And the reason for this is actually in the way how those learned components are realized today, namely by the large uh, high efforts that are needed for the training data collection that I showed you before. So for every single component today that you want to replace and for every single database, you need to actually execute a large training collection, meaning you need to run tens of, of thousands of training queries uh, on potentially large databases, which might actually take hours or even days to simply 
get the training data while the model training itself is actually not that expensive. And as I said before, this is not a one-time effort since the training data collection needs to repeat it for every new database, meaning if you have a new set of tables with new data, we need to rerun the training data collection or even simply if the database is updated. And clearly for every new component that you wanna train a machine learning model for, you need to rerun the training data collection and uh, collect information about the observations. For example, if you wanna learn an optimizer versus uh, another component, you might uh, you need to rerun the, the training data collection. So what is the vision behind uh, the, the work that I'm presenting today? And the vision of uh, this line of work called Learn Database Components 2.0 is that we actually want to avoid these high costs of workload-driven learning and maybe even uh, uh, go in a direction where we can use the very same model for different databases or even different tasks, as Emmanuel said at the beginning. But overall, for making this vision of Learn Database Components uh, real, uh, so we, we've been pushing forward two different ideas. And the first idea uh, is idea uh, that we call data-driven learning, which is a bit different. So here it's not about reusing a model uh, for uh, uh, that we train once and then fine tune here. It's more about the observation that sometimes we can learn models for database components without actually running any workload. And the basic idea here is that we simply capture the, uh, the data distribution in a, in a, in a, in a, in a machine learning model, uh, which allows us already to uh, uh, realize components such as cardinality estimation or learned indexing or other approaches that simply can rely on the knowledge of how data is distributed in a database uh, without actually the need to run any query uh, and uh, train the model for, for, for this task. However, uh, by simply using data characteristics, we are limited in the number of tasks we can do with a learned model. And therefore, uh, in the recent time, we've been uh, also suggesting a second direction, which is what Emmanuel referred to, which is the idea of zero-shot learning, which is a second direction that helps us to uh, reduce the training efforts when, re uh, when realizing a new component. And here the idea is, as Emmanuel said, that we train a model for example, across several databases uh, in a pre-training phase, such that the model can generalize to a new unseen database, either completely out of the box, so without any additional training overhead, or by simply with uh, fine-tuning the model with a little overhead, so meaning with uh, hopefully only a few training queries instead of tens of, of thousands of queries. And the beauty uh, of the approach on the right-hand side is that we think that this uh, since it can capture workload characteristics, uh, uh, not only data characteristics, it uh, has a broader applicability to different tasks. And actually we think that with this approach, we can scale learning to a full database system. And interestingly, uh, we think that both uh, are not isolated approaches, but uh, data-driven learning informs zero-shot learning. And Benjamin will talk later about uh, the second part and also what we mean by inform that a data-driven learning uh, approach informs the zero-shot learning approach. But the basic idea here is that uh, the information about data distributions are actually used as information, as input for zero-shot models when we transfer it to a new database. And therefore, uh, we, we, think, we, we suggest that data-driven learning and zero-shot learning should go hand in hand. So let me start with the first part. So data-driven learning, where the idea is where we, we can, that we can build machine learning models uh, to replace database components by simply looking at the data distributions. And here, so uh, the basic idea is that a data-driven model learns actually a multivariate data distribution over a complex relational database, meaning uh, across attributes within a table, but also across tables. And uh, uh, so uh, the idea here is that we, uh, instead of running a workload, we take a database, we sample from the database, uh, the data, uh, a certain smaller data set, and then train a model directly on this smaller sample. Therefore, uh, this approach actually can scale also to larger databases. And as I said, uh, at runtime, once we train such a model, we can use it uh, for, to solve different tasks, for example, cardinality estimation, but also many other tasks as I uh, will discuss a bit later in the talk. And the benefits of this approach are clear. Since you directly take the data without running any workload, you completely save this high cost of training data collection. 
And moreover, uh, what I will also show in this talk is by the models that we actually develop for data-driven learning, because we suggested a new class of models, we can directly ingest updates in the model architecture. So the models are designed in a way that you don't need to retrain, but you can directly actually uh, uh, change the model weights uh, when uh, insert or update is happening in your database system, uh, on a database. Um, so to show you the basic idea of data-driven learning, um, let me take a, a, a simple example of a database system of a database component where we want to use data-driven learning for, which is cardinality estimation. And uh, to bring everybody here on the same page, let me quickly recap what cardinality estimation, uh, uh, the for example, uh, you have a query given like uh, the one on shown on the slide, which joins uh, three tables, customers, orders, and order lines. And the first step that a database system typically needs to do uh, in query optimization is to define a good join order. And the join order in a database system, uh, so meaning which table should be joined first, here customer with orders first, for example, and then order line or another order, uh, depends on the intermediate cardinalities. And here in this query plan, you could first, uh, to define a query, uh, to define the join order, you could first estimate the uh, uh, cardinalities, intermediate cardinalities for that plan. Um, which would give us a certain sizes for the intermediate results, and we would compare it to other join orders, for example, this join order, which would produce smaller cardinalities and thus a better execution strategy for the database system, which should be actually taken then at the end. And the question is now, uh, 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 so how to estimate this cardinality in an exact manner, because based on these cardinalities, uh, the query plan or the query execution strategy is, 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 is chosen. So to solve this cardinality estimation problem, uh, several classical techniques such as histograms or other forms of synopsis exist. But recently, some line of work has shown that you can use uh, DNNs to predict cardinalities. And the seminal work in this direction was from Andreas Kipf, where they actually used uh, this paradigm of workload-driven learning that I introduced at the beginning to solve the cardinality estimation problem. And in their paper, they show if they run tens of thousands of queries and collect cardinalities for different join orders that they use as training data, they can come up with uh, highly accurate cardinality estimation components. But uh, again, with the downsides that I mentioned before, that you need to really spend for every single database high training uh, efforts to collect the training data. So to tackle this issue, uh, we developed a new class of models that follow the, follows this data-driven learning paradigm that I mentioned before, where we want to learn a cardinality estimation model by simply looking at the data without need, the need to run any workload. And for this, we developed a new class of models based on an existing model architecture called some product networks. And this new class of model, uh, models that we developed uh, is, uh, uh, is called relational sum product networks. The idea is that we uh, tweaked some product networks that can learn multivariate data distributions for uh, being able to run on a relational database with multiple tables that are linked with foreign key primary key relationships. And the idea is that this uh, model architecture learns the data distribution, as I said before, within tables, so within attributes of a single table, but also across tables, such that we can then use this model to estimate cardinalities of arbitrary join queries over this given schema. In detail, what we do here is actually that we, when given a database with multiple tables, so for example, look at the right-hand side where we have a database with four tables, we actually don't learn one large RSPN, so one large relational sum product network for the full database, because uh, uh, so this is not needed and would also, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, some sense, uh, 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 lead to maybe uh, 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 too much overhead in, in preparing the data for learning the model. So instead, what we do is that we learn an ensemble of RSPNs uh, for a database, meaning we cut the database uh, into multiple smaller models. So here in this case, we would learn an RSPN for the set of order and customer table, as well as an RSPN for the order line and store table individually. And then uh, we can later on use this uh, ensemble of RSPNs 
and combine them in an arbitrary manner to uh, do a cardinality estimation for join queries. So for example, if you have a join query for the, uh, that joins the store order and order line table, you could still estimate the cardinalities for such a query, uh, even though there doesn't exist a single RSPN to do that, uh, but we can combine several RSPNs. And moreover, uh, RSPNs are updatable, as I said at the beginning, uh, and I'll show you later on uh, how we actually support direct updates of, of a, of a data-driven model uh, uh, with, with our model architecture. So to understand how RSPNs work, let me start with the simple case that we learn a data-driven model for the single table case. So where we only learn an RSPN for a database with one table. And later on, I will generalize this to a database with multiple tables. So the basic idea is uh, that RSPNs learn uh, the structure of a relational table. So it's a kind of structure learning approach. And the basic idea is that we recursively cluster uh, uh, the rows and columns with a model uh, such that we learn the data distribution of a table. So for that, let's look at the example here on the left-hand side. Uh, so here we have a simple table, so customer table with only two attributes for simplicity, which lists uh, customers uh, uh, from Europe and Asia, for example, that have different ages. And for learning the data distribution of that model, uh, we would, uh, in the first uh, se uh, step in to learn uh, uh, RSPN, uh, find out clusters of similar rows. And here we use a, sim a simple uh, clustering technique. Uh, you can, uh, so uh, you can simply use k-means for that, for example, to cluster tuples with similar characteristics into so-called row clusters. And then within each row cluster, uh, 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 we then further split the columns in this row cluster to see which columns are independent. So we would check in, a, in, a, in, in one of these clusters whether uh, a certain subset of attributes are independent from each other and then split them in ind independent column clusters. Uh, here in this example, since we only have uh, two attributes, the question is uh, if the uh, customer age and region attribute are already independent, if yes, we would split them apart. Otherwise, we would continue with the row clustering to produce smaller clusters. So for simplicity, assume now both uh, attributes in each row cluster are considered independent, which means that for our model, we would split these uh, individual columns into uh, different branches of our model. Uh, uh, and at the leaf nodes, we would uh, use uh, uh, information or store information about the data distribution of each individual column. So the basic idea here of the, on the, of the model that we would learn on the simple table is uh, that uh, uh, the uh, sum node at the top separates the row clusters, meaning that 30% of the, of the data goes into the left branch of the model and 70% to the right branch. And then we would split up the individual columns by this multiplication node. And so, as I said before, this model is, is built recursively. So we can have multiple layers of this uh, summation and product nodes such that uh, the model actually learns to fit the data distribution within each cluster in optimal manner. Uh, and uh, we can split uh, within each uh, uh, branch the rows further down into smaller clusters or uh, also the column clusters that we split apart could be different in different branches of the model. Once you have such a model uh, that uh, uh, learns the data distribution uh, of, of, of a given table in an accurate manner, you can use it to compute uh, expectations and probabilities uh, on uh, certain attributes, for example, to uh, estimate selectivities uh, uh, of SQL queries. So for example, if you have a query like this, where you wanna know how many customers are from Europe and have an age uh, less than 30, you could propagate this down the, the tree to the leaves and see it within each of the uh, data distribution that we store on the leaves, leaves how many come, customers come from Europe and how many customers are below 30 years. Uh, uh, since uh, within the different uh, 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 branches, we assume independence of column clusters, which we just multiply the the probabilities and then do a weighted uh, summation of the probabilities to come up with the overall fraction of customers that are stored uh, that are coming from Europe and are, 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 young, are younger than 30. So in this case, uh, 
uh, we will just uh, uh, add the uh, the probabilities uh, from coming from the left and the right branch. So I've shown you now how a model would be learned on a on a single table and how you can use this to actually do kind or already kind of cardinality estimation for simple filter predicates on the single table, but not yet joins. The next thing that I quickly want to show you is how updates work on this model, because I said uh, data driven models that we use so RSPNs can directly ingest updates and the basic idea here is if you have such a model on a single table. We would do for integrating interesting updates, we would do a top down pass on this model whenever a new tuple, for example, is inserted into your table, but updates would work similarly because you can model them with a delete and an insert. So assume now an insert is coming, which inserts a new tuple, meaning a new customer from Europe of the age of 100. What this would, uh, what 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 is needed to update the model is then to find out which cluster uh, this tuple belongs to. So I'm assume in our case uh, it falls into the left cluster. So we push it down the left branch, update the weights, and then also readjust the data distributions on the leap. And we've shown that in experiments that actually, if you use this scheme uh, uh, in, in a database system and uh, start with a model uh, and just uh, that you learn on a fraction of the database and then even need, uh, do heavy updates on, on your tables, that the model is still accurate un unless uh, the data distribution doesn't change significantly. If the data distribution changes, you have to do uh, readjustments of your structure that you learned uh, to, uh, to, uh, to capture the data distribution. So here we would update the model directly and here just a second example which uh, further updates the left branch uh, to show that this is similar to an index update where you just propagate down these tuples to the leaves and update the, 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 the leaf distributions of, of our model instead of updating the leaves maybe of an index. So this is how updates work. Now <laughs> I come to the slide that I moved back a minute before. The question is now, uh, so now uh, uh, you, you might have uh, got the idea how we deal with uh, uh, databases uh, or learn models on a single table. The question is now, how do we scale this to relational databases that might consist of multiple tables and how do we support joins? And the naive attempt would be clearly if you have, let's say, a database with three tables that for every possible join path, we would pre-compute the join of the tables. So here, if you assume we have three tables, customer order online, you would uh, pre produce a, a table for every, or re so an output for every possible join, and then learn an RSPN on top of the materialized join. But this is clearly expensive, and it's maybe not scalable to large schemata. Uh, while it would clearly already help you to, to solve uh, the kernel estimation problem for all particular uh, uh, join uh, join path in a given schema. Um, but instead of doing uh, this approach, the naive approach, where we learn one model per uh, possible join path, uh, uh, instead, as I said before, what we do is we learn partial models that we can then combine at runtime by a new idea of so-called tuple factors that we introduce in the tables and that are learned with the model. And to explain what tuple factors are, uh, let me quickly give you uh, the example of, of how this works uh, uh, for the two different cases uh, where we uh, need tuple factors. So assume, for example, you have a database with three tables and uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, in, for these uh, three tables, we learned two RSPNs, so one over custom and orders and one for order line. And there can be now two cases where we need to uh, uh, use tuple factors. So the first case is where the query is smaller than the model. So for example, here we, if we learn an RSPN uh, on, uh, on uh, the customer and uh, order RSPN, and we just want to know cardinalities for the customer table. So if you have a query that is smaller than the model, we would need to readjust uh, the output of a model and therefore we would uh, also need the tuple factors. And the same case holds uh, where we uh, have two RSPNs and want to combine several RSPNs. In this case, we would also use the tuple factors. So to understand now this basic concept of tuple factors, let me concentrate on the left case. Uh, so where we learn a larger RSPN, but we also we just want to do uh, uh, the cardinality estimates on a smaller uh, for a smaller query. 
Um, but the, as I said, the approach works similarly for, for the other direction. So assume now we learn the RSPN on the join of customer and orders, and we simply want to only know cardinalities for a customer query. For this case, for this case, uh, uh, we learn, uh, so we keep these tuple factors in a table that tell us, so with how many orders a customer was uh, joined with. Um, so, uh, so here, for example, the first customer, uh, the European customer uh, with H20 uh, would, have, uh, would have two orders. So meaning the first two lines uh, result from a customer uh, that has, has two orders. And this information is used in order to adjust the results of, 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 of the model output. Uh, so here is how we do this. As I said, the tuple factors is an attribute that we learn simply uh, uh, with the model, meaning that we can uh, simply calculate for a given customer, what is the expected number of orders that the customer would have. And so uh, we use this information when we uh, want to readjust the cardinality. So for example, here in our case, what we could do is in order to compute the uh, probabilities, for example, if we just want to know which customers are from Europe, uh, we would take uh, the overall size of the table, so the size of the outer join that results from joining uh, customers with uh, orders, and then multiply it uh, with uh, the number of uh, tuples uh, that uh, the expectation of uh, how many customers come from Europe, which would be three, fifth, uh, three over five, and then uh, also multiply it with the expected uh, number of uh, uh, how many orders a typical uh, customer has who comes from Europe, but use it to readjust, renormalize the, the value. So we just divide uh, the results by, uh, of the earth cardinalities by the number of orders that such a customer would have. And overall, we thus get that in total, approximately three customers uh, uh, would come from Europe uh, given uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the model output, the readjusted model output uh, with these tuple factors. So uh, here we use the number of, of, of typical of number of orders that a typical customer has to, to rebate uh, the expectation. So um, uh, let me quickly show you a few uh, results where we used uh, this approach to do cardinality estimation on a benchmark called Job Light. Uh, the benchmark, the Job Light benchmark, is based on the uh, IMDb database, um, which is uh, uh, a modeling a movie database. I think you, everybody knows that, so it contains information about actors, movies, and uh, directors, and uh, formulates several joint queries over this database, and has been used in in other uh, cardinality estimation papers, uh, so in learned and non-learned approaches. And we compare DeepDB against those learned and non-learned approaches, so against the workload-driven approach from KIPF, but also the non-learned approach, uh, approaches that are used in practice today, so some approaches like index-based join sampling, but also just uh, random sampling, for example. And here is the result that you see. Um, uh, uh, so here uh, we report the quality of our cardinality estimates compared to those baselines. And we use a metric called Q error, uh, which uh, reports the relative error of the cardinality estimation, meaning so how much over or underestimate we, uh, we how much over or underestimate, uh, how much we over or underestimate the cardinalities, sorry. Uh, and uh, so one means that we would have perfect cardinalities and uh, three means that we uh, that an approach overestimates or underestimates the cardinalities by, cardinalities by factor three. And we see that deep DB in the, med in the median, but also in the percentiles and max error outperforms the other approaches. So the learned MCSN approach, but also the non-learned approaches. And uh, second, we also in the paper we've shown, for example, that the model can nicely generalize to complex queries, uh, even though that uh, uh, DeepDB or our approach doesn't rely on any workload information. Simply by combining the RSPNs, we can uh, support multi-way joins. So here, the x-axis shows the first number shows how many tables we join. So four, one means a four-way join with a single predicate on one table. Uh, four, five means that we have a four-way join with five predicates on different attributes. And you see that our approach provides, uh, compared to um, MCSN, which is the workload-driven approach, 
much lower Q error for complex queries. In particular, if MCSN uh, 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 needs to make predictions uh, for queries it hasn't seen during uh, the training phase, the results are getting worse. So here, I think in this experiment, we trained on on only a certain number of, 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 of tables and then scaled it up uh, to see how the models can generalize. Um, interestingly, so this line of data-driven learning has had now a lot of follow-up work and uh, that try to improve upon what we did in our initial work. So there's a paper from uh, Alibaba called factorized SPNs, which directly took uh, uh, our uh, results and tried to uh, better learn uh, uh, certain uh, for certain uh, cases um, versus uh, Eurocard uh, also went in a sim similar uh, direction from the idea, but used a different model architecture. And data-driven learning, uh, 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 we, so we've been using this idea of learning data distribution to solve many other data database tasks. So we have not only used it for cardinality estimation, but we, in the same paper, in the deep debate paper, we've also shown how we can use a data-driven learning for uh, query answering. So in particular for answering aggregate queries in an approximate manner. So meaning average sum queries, for example, can be also answered directly by the model instead of going down to the data. But we have also had other papers where we use this general direction of data-driven learning to solve other database tasks like indexing, data cleaning, and many other tasks uh, are possible even uh, that we, we think that we can use these data-driven models to directly solve machine learning tasks uh, on, on such a data-driven model. For example, a classical uh, uh, regression or classification task could be used, uh, could be solved uh, with, uh, with a data-driven model uh, uh, if, you, if you understand the data distribution. In fact, SPNs uh, where we base on our models that have been used for such tasks. However, as I said before, data-driven learning uh, uh, has we've, we've shown that it has uh, promising results that can even outperform workload driven models, but it's no silver bullet as well because it's limited in a number of tasks or, or kinds of tasks that it can support. Most importantly, tasks that require information about the complexity of workloads, so something that needs to predict uh, the runtime of queries, for example, where the knowledge about how complex or how much uh, so how complex is, it, for example, a certain query execution strategy such as a hash join? So where this information about workload complexity is needed is nothing that you can directly solve with workload driven learning. And therefore, we've been proposing this second direction of zero shot learning, which can uh, support a much broader set of tasks, uh, uh, which uh, will now uh, be presented by Benjamin in the second half of the talk. And okay, all right. Um, thanks for the introduction. So now we will um, go to the uh, second contribution, which is uh, zero shot learning for DB masses. Um, and this is basically uh, what Emmanuel mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Um, so here we want to learn a model that generalizes across databases. Um, what do we mean by this? Um, so in general, as Carsten mentioned before, we pre-train such a model over several databases learn a single model and then this model can be used for many many unseen databases that you can see on the right so before we had to learn one model for every of those unseen databases and in particular we had to run ten thousands of training queries for all of these unseen databases and now the idea is that we can use this single model and just reuse it for every unseen database and uh, just to make it very explicit, um, by database in this case, we mean a data set, so a certain schema with tuples uh, and a workload. Um, we don't mean database system for now. So for now, we assume that uh, we only consider one database system like Postgres or something. Um, okay. Um, so as I said, we want to pre-train uh, once and then uh, generalize to unseen databases. And what by generalize, that could mean we just use the model directly um, for the unseen database or we fine tune the model. And that would mean, um, so for instance, it could be in the cloud that the custom has already executed a couple of queries, um, but probably not 10,000, but maybe a few. And we would just use those queries to fine tune our model. So retrain our model a little bit on those additional queries and use this information to even improve our um, zero-shot model. So this is the general idea of zero-shot learning for databases. 
And this is, um, as mentioned before, inspired by uh, recent advances in uh, natural language processing. Uh, so with models like GPT-3 um, from, from OpenAI. Um, the, the first problem we focus on in our work is um, physical cost estimation and just to bring everyone on the same page. So here the idea is that we basically show that zero shot um, uh, models can work for databases. And the task here that we, that we looked at first was um, predicting the runtime given a certain query plan. So for instance, here we have a query plan that simply joins two tables with a certain join operator and then we do an aggregation. And what we want to know beforehand is um, that this plan takes uh, 300 milliseconds. Um, and this is a really crucial task in databases because it's used for query optimization. So we could basically um, choose the right plan so we can compare different plans, enumerate different plans, and then take the plan that probably has the lowest runtime. So that's how this is used for query optimization and query planning, but we can also use it for design advisors. So for instance, if you want to know which indexes or materialized views are worth creating, um, then this is also a really useful model because you can basically do this what if estimate. So if I had created this materialized view, how much faster would my query run? So is it really worth creating the materialized view? Um, and today this is tackled using simple cost models, which are often inaccurate. So often just some linear model, um, which is hand-tuned by engineers. And of course they are often inaccurate because you have a lot of uh, complex effects in those query plans like uh, cache effects, et cetera, uh, operator interactions. And this is something you can just capture if you, if you take such um, simplistic models. Um, you can also take it uh, using workload driven learning. And this is the same principle that we've seen before. So in this, um, this is what, what Carsten has shown in the very beginning. So here we would just run 10,000 of queries on one database and then uh, basically learn a single model on this database to predict um, the costs. And now you might just ask, okay, well, we have the workload driven models, right? And we just wanna have a model that basically generalizes to unseen databases. So can we just train such a workload driven model and then use this on every unseen database um, to achieve zero shot databases? So the idea would be just, hey, take this workload driven model and not just train it on a single database, but on several databases. Wouldn't that fix the issue already? Um, the problem is that uh, this is not possible due to the basic architecture of workload driven models. Um, and the, the main reason for this is that the featureization would be inconsistent for multiple databases. So let's have a look at a really simple example. So if you want to tell or communicate to your model that certain columns are, so for instance, for IMDb, you would want to tell the model that the movie ratings column is queried and the movie runtime uh, query is, uh, column is queried. Um, the way we currently encode this in workload driven models is using one hot encodings. Um, so basically the first column would be one, zero, zero, et cetera. And then movie runtime would be zero, one, et cetera. And if you now want to encode that a certain column is queried, you would just use the encoding and uh, feed that into your machine learning model. And now if you have a second database, let's say SSB, which is a star schema benchmark, the first column might of course be something completely different. It might be a region column. And the second column might be a price column. And as you can see, those columns, they have nothing in common, right? They, even the data types won't match, right? Um, but for the model, they will look exactly the same because the encodings are similar. So you would feed the same information into your model and your model would be very confused. So you have no similarities despite this uh, identical encoding. And now you might wonder, well, okay, um, this seems like a really technical problem. Maybe there's some simple fix to this, right? Um, the problem is there is no simple fix because um, the assumption that the database is really a single database, this is really hard coded into the model architecture because the underlying reason is that existing models jointly learn both the data distribution and the system behavior. So they will both learn, for instance, that the movie runtime and the movie rated, rating are correlated in some way which of course might not hold true for the, the SSP database. And they, they might also learn general system behavior. So it's like a linear scan, a sequential scan on your data is approximately linear in the size of your data and, and such things, right? And since they learn both things and the data distribution will of course change for every database, you cannot make them generalize to unseen databases. And that's the fundamental problem 
um, that we also had to tackle um, when we tried to solve um, zero-shot learning for cost estimation. So the first contribution uh, of uh, zero-shot cost models, um, uh, which are our, our introduced models, is a proper encoding. And here the goal of this encoding is to make it work across databases. So we want to have an encoding that is um, that has the same semantics for every database you see and really generalizes across databases. And the way we do this is um, using, first of all, a graph encoding, where the entire query plan, so plan operators, predicates, tables, etc., cetera, are encoded as graph nodes. And this gives us the entire flexibility of graphs, first of all. And then for each graph node, we, of course, still need features to, for instance, communicate that a plan node is a hash join or to communicate that, a, that the intermediate cardinalities of some operator are this and this, this high or that the tuple width has a certain amount of bytes. Um, but all the features we use are transferable. And by transferable, we mean this is a general uh, representation that again generalizes across databases. So for instance, we would use tuple width and data type, et cetera, to characterize a column instead of saying, this is the first column, which is essentially what a one-hot encoding does, because the first column might be completely different uh, for, for a new database. So um, here's a little um, example. I think you can see my mouse, right? Um, of a really simple query. And as you can see, um, this uh, consists of two sequential scans. Then we uh, build a hash table and then execute a hash and then uh, execute some aggregation on top. And these are the, the simple um, plan nodes of this, uh, of this plan. And then, of course, we also have to tell the model which columns are scanned. And we um, basically express this by introducing um, table and attribute nodes. And as I said, the features that we use um, to represent that certain tables and attributes are queried are transferable. So for instance, instead of saying this is the first table, we say this table has um, 21 um, pages, uh, in our, uh, uh, fits on 21 uh, database pages. Or we say that the column has the data type integer. We say that the operator is equals. So for instance, we would not uh, encode the literals of the, of the predicates. We wouldn't say that we, say, that we um, query a certain attribute to equal seven. We just say it's an equal operator. Um, because again, literals depends on the data distribution and that changes. Um, but of course, uh, you might now wonder, okay, if we, if we don't say what literals are queried, we don't know how large intermediate result sizes are, right? So we are super agnostic uh, to the data distribution. That, of course, doesn't work. And our solution to this is that we basically input intermediate cardinalities as an additional feature to the model. So the model would only learn, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, uh, linear scan is, uh, sequential scan is linear in the, in the size of the data. And then as an input, we say, this is the size of the data. This is how many tuples we expect. So those intermediate cardinalities are an additional feature to our models. And I said earlier, or Kasten said earlier, that um, data-driven models inform zero-shot models. And this is exactly how they inform zero-shot models. They basically take the intermediate cardinality estimates and use these as features. And this is how we can know how large certain intermediate uh, result sizes are and how long certain queries will probably take. And now this is a, this is a graph. And now we use um, something that is very well established in the machine learning literature. Uh, graph neural networks. Um, we don't exactly use an existing architecture because we exploit and um, that this is a DAC. Um, so we use a, a specifically um, tailored architecture for um, directed acyclic uh, graphs, um, but it's similar to a gene N, um, and then uh, predict the, the runtime of an unseen query. And this is a very flexible representation. Um, so if you, for instance, only trained on like up to four way joints, you would, the model would have only seen like um, four hash joints uh, potentially as, as graph nodes. And now if you have like one additional uh, uh, joint, so you have five way joints, you would just have an additional node in your graph and the model can uh, basically generalize um, to, to these um, workloads. And if you have an unseen database, you would just introduce different table and attribute nodes in your graph. And this is how we get this flexibility of really generalizing um, to a new database. Um, and now a second contribution. Um, so if you, if you think about like, how would I train such a model? Uh, the main challenge is, of course, 
the question, has the model now seen a sufficient amount of training data? So imagine you are Amazon and you've trained your model on like 100 databases. Then of course, a natural question to ask is, okay, uh, is the model now um, like profound enough or robust enough to generalize to the next customer or do I need more training data? Um, and here, our idea is basically to, to estimate the generalization performance. So similar to um, cross-validation in machine learning. So what we do is we estimate uh, using a holdout database. So we basically, instead of training on all databases, we just train on, let's say, 90% of our databases. And then we estimate how accurate the model was on the remaining databases as in cross-validation. And if we assume that the databases and workloads come in IID, we can estimate how well our model will generalize to an unseen database. Um, and then we can just stop uh, if the estimated performance is either acceptable or stagnates. So on the right, we actually did this with uh, real-world databases. And what we've seen that in our cases, um, the performance, we, we've, we've already seen diminishing returns after like 15 databases. So we don't need crazy amounts of databases. So they are they have a very large variety in different data distributions, different queries, et cetera. But we've seen that in at least for, for the database we looked at and the workloads we looked at, you don't need a crazy high amount of databases. And in fact, after 15 databases, we already saw those um, diminishing returns. So those are the two main contributions of the paper. So first of all, um, encoding this in the right way such that it can generalize potentially. And then second, um, also estimating the, the generalization performance of the model to know basically when to stop training. Um, and now, of course, the interesting question is, does this work, right? Um, so the, the first experiment we did, um, so we, so of course, uh, of this work was actually gathering a real world relation data, data sets because this is not something that is like easily available. So it's not as easy as just going to Kaggle, uh, as you probably know, because in, in Kaggle, you only have like single tables, but we really need like relational data sets. So several tables connected via foreign keys. Um, so we, we gathered um, those, those real world databases and, and workloads. And what we did is we trained on 19 of those um, databases and workloads and tried to generalize to the 20th database. And on the y-axis, you see this median Q error that we've seen before. In this, so this time, it's it's not about the cardinalities; it's about the the runtime, right? Um, and again, one is the best, so that means we have exactly predicted the right runtime. And as you can see, both zero-shot models, so both a zero-shot model that is kind of an upper baseline that uses exact cardinality, but, but also a model that uses such a data-driven model that we've described earlier. They are really, really robust and really accurate. So we are close to one in the in the Q error, and we are much more accurate than the uh, optimizer cost estimates of, of Postgres. Um, and I, I say scaled um, because um, if you if you look at query plans, um, they they basically express cost units, um, and they are not directly milliseconds. Um, and what we of course did is we basically scaled um, those cost units to um, match the times, the execution times of queries uh, to have a, a fair comparison. So that if at first shows, okay, it's, it's somewhat feasible to generalize to an unseen database. Um, and of course, um, uh, second question is, well, um, that's all nice, but it's, it's not nice if it's not as accurate as workload driven learning, right? Um, so what we did is, uh, in an additional experiment, um, we compared the performance of our model against state-of-the-art workload-driven models. And as we've said earlier, the, the, the pain of deploying workload-driven models is not actually um, training the models themselves, but gathering the training data. That's what hurts in practice. So what we vary on the, on the x-axis is basically the number of training queries we allow from 100 to 50,000 um, training queries, which is quite a bit. If you think about that, you cannot see any updates um, before uh, you are finished collecting those uh, 50,000 queries. And on the y-axis, we again have the, the Q error, the median Q error. And um, this is the same benchmark we've used earlier, so job light benchmark, which is again real-world data, so IMDB. And uh, what we see is that the best workload-driven model that's really state-of-the-art needs more than, so approximately 50,000 queries um, to actually match the performance of um, zero-shot models. So they are really accurate. And again, this zero-shot model has not seen anything on IMDb before on the, on the movie database. And 
Um, this is actually not a fair comparison for us because of course we can also make use of those additional training queries. So if we use those training queries also for the zero shot model, uh, we can become much more accurate also and improve over the pure zero shot performance. So we actually then uh, even beat the uh, workflow driven model for 50,000 queries. Um, and that's the few shot case um, because we make use of those additional queries. Um, we think that, so I've, I've shown you all the results for cost estimation, but we think that zero shot learning is really applicable also beyond cost estimation um, to other database tasks. So one uh, I mentioned earlier is materialized view selection or in general, physical design tuning. So here the idea is we could just use such a cost estimation model to predict the benefit of creating a materialized view um, and use that to pick the right set of materialized views. And um, we actually had a, um, had a thesis recently um, where we explored this idea and this also seems to work quite well in practice. Um, so using zero shot models to guide in selecting the right materialized views. Um, in addition, um, there's been a long line of work on learn query optimization, but they are all workload driven uh, to stay in our terminology. So you all have to observe um, many, many queries on one database to have a learned optimizer. And zero-shot models could potentially also be applied to uh, learn query optimization. So a really simple idea, uh, I'm sure there are better ideas, but a really simple idea could just be enumerate different plans that your query optimizer gives you, and then choose the cheapest plan uh, with respect to our zero-shot model, and then execute this plan instead of the default plan of the database. Um, we think there are maybe even applications beyond databases. So one is data structure design. Um, you might be aware of this um, paper from Stratos Idreos, where the idea is to combine primitives to derive new data structures. So instead of designing like new B trees uh, or new, new variants of like uh, B trees um, manually um, to basically fit new hardware characteristics, um, they propose to have some primitives and combine them in arbitrary ways to fit the hardware best and get the best performance uh, for a certain workload. Um, but of course, what is really hard about this is actually choosing the right primitives to get the best performance. And we think that this is a really non-trivial problem. And um, we think this is maybe as complex or maybe even more complex than estimating the costs of, of um, database query plans. And we think that, that this would, would be also a really nice fit for zero-shot learning because you would need the power of machine learning, but at the same time, um, you can generalize to new workloads, to new data sets um, without having to try out like 10,000s of, of index structure designs in, in this example. Um, and there are also um, uh, applications uh, in the machine learning uh, system side itself. Um, so for instance, there's this paper um, by, by Google where um, people try to optimize the placement of tensor operations uh, for efficient training. So, here, the, the goal is basically to place your, uh, to find a good placement for your machine learning operations in a distributed GPU setup to get the optimal uh, inference or training uh, performance. And this is also a really highly non trivial problem. But um, again, in our terminology, this is a, what they propose as a workload driven approach. So if you have a new neural network architecture, you would have to train the model again. And of course, there are many neural network architectures nowadays. So it would be nice to have something that works out of the box also for unseen uh, neural network architectures. And we think this is something that is uh, interesting uh, to explore. Um, so with all these examples, we just wanted to emphasize that we think that zero-shot learning could be really a more broader and general idea for, for a learn systems. So not necessarily just learn cost estimation, but certainly learn databases and maybe even beyond. Um, so as a, as a summary, um, we propose zero-shot learning for databases. Um, here the idea is we generalize to unseen databases without training queries or only fine-tuning uh, training queries. We think this um, pretty much fits what, what you need as a cloud DBMS vendor because you want the models to really work out of the box uh, for new customers. Um, and we think that this also generalizes to uh, other tasks beyond um, cost estimation, such as physical design tuning, knob tuning, et cetera. And um, that already concludes our talk. So um, thanks for your attention. And now we are ready to take questions.